Good afternoon, everybody. It's Jeff Phillips at College Frog. How are you? I hope, uh, hope everything's going great. It's uh, 2 o'clock on the East Coast, and um, even though I typically mess up my time zone calculations, uh, I think everybody has made it here on time, and uh, we're so glad that you're here. I'm in Pensacola, Florida, northwest Florida in the Gulf of Mexico, and I'm really glad that all of you are here uh, for our session today on the CPA exam, um, CPA exam information session with Wiley CPA Excel. I um, wanted to thank FICPA, that's the Florida Institute of CPAs in Tallahassee, Florida, for uh, helping organize and being a partner in, in, with College Frog and educating accounting students. Um, uh, it, many of you are, are calling in from Florida today, and we welcome you, and a lot of you are, are from outside of our state, and we're really glad you're here, too. That's great that you're here, because today's message is really for everyone who's thinking about passing the CPA exam. Um, while we will cover a couple quick uh, requirements in Florida, um, it's, it's really for everybody. It, if you're new to College Frog, um, we're really glad you're here. So College Frog is a job board, uh, kind of like Monster.com, but for the accounting world. And you'll find over 600 firms ranging from big four to global industry to, uh, to small local firms trying to hire interns and entry level on our site. And when you build a profile on College Frog, you get found by you can be found by recruiters at firms who search, and, uh, and you can also apply to jobs. And the other half of, of what we do is, is we, we try to be the best source of career education for accounting students. And to that end, um, we're always available uh, for feedback, and we love to hear what topics you'd be interested in. Um, in fact, uh, you, you, could, you could give me that feedback during the information session today. Um, today we're going to talk about the CPA exam something that is near and dear to all of your hearts, I'm sure, how to get started, how to prepare, and you know how it goes. The sooner you pass, the more eligible for jobs you're going to be, or if you already have a job, uh, the sooner you're going to be unbillable, and, and that is, that's, that's golden. Um, it, the exam, if you, if, you, if you haven't started the process, it takes a while. It's quite an investment, and, and, and choosing how uh, you approach the test is totally critical to success or failure. And so you're in for a treat um, today. At the end of the call, we're going to have Q&A. You've got a question panel on your um, go-to webinar panel there. And so I hope that you'll type in your Q&A there. It's very important because we want Mike and, and uh, Angie to also be able to uh, answer your questions. Please interact and ask us questions. Use that, that Q&A panel to suggest other webinars that you think would be beneficial to you. We're here to listen, and we, we will bring in the experts that you need to uh, get off to a great career start. Um, so, so that's it. I do want to do one thing. If you're on the call, you'll know what I'm going to ask you. I'd like you to uh, use that question and answer panel to tell us uh, what school you're, you currently attend. Or if you're a graduate, tell me where you graduated from. So just type it in that panel and go ahead and press enter, and then uh, I'll see it. We'll make sure that it all works. There we go. Truman State, West Florida, right here in Pensacola, Flagler, and I think that's in St. Petersburg, right? Thank you. FSU, Florida Gulf Coast University, Metro State University of Minnesota. I think you win the uh, longest distance for today. Oakton Community College, um, Cal Bakersfield, FAU, that's Florida Atlantic, Nova, Southern Illinois. Mike, didn't you graduate from Southern Illinois? Am I right? Um, we'll we'll get, get you on in a second and ask you that. Liberty University, Winthrop in South Carolina, um, University of Idaho, Fordham in New York City, North Carolina A&T. Um, so Angie, uh, when, when, as you can tell, I know you're on mute, but a lot of Florida colleges here, but also a lot of from around the country. So that's always fun to, uh, to see where everybody's calling in from. Thank you guys for doing that. And now you know how to use question and answers, which is perfect. So. Moving on, um, I want to introduce Angie Brook. Angie is the manager of the Emerging Professionals Program for the Florida Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Angie's an awesome resource. She, her, uh, she spends her time working with accounting students. Angie, um, tell us what's going on with the FICPA, and, and if you don't mind kicking things off, to tell us a little bit about uh, the expectations to pass the exam in, in Florida, if you would, please. And, and Angie, um, before you begin, thank you so much for helping organize today. Oh, no problem. Thank you all. 
Uh, welcome everyone to the call today, and I hope that you find this information beneficial. I know that navigating the CPA exam is, is quite daunting and, and stressful because I get emails from students all day, every day, um, asking questions and, and trying to make sure they're taking the correct courses and they're on the right path. Um, as uh, Jeff mentioned, I'm the Emerging Professionals Manager with the Florida Institute of CPAs. My primary duties are to do student outreach and recruiting into the accounting field, and I also work with our young professionals group and go around and do networking events with them. So today we'll talk about the FICPA um, a little tiny bit and then more of the Florida requirements for licensure. I understand a lot of you are not from Florida, um, but let me just give you this little tidbit. The, the uh, requirements that I'm going to discuss are specific to Florida, but every state that I'm pretty much aware of has a state society similar to the FICPA. So you can reach out to your local state society and find out the information from them as to what is required in that state. The Florida Board of Accountancy sets those requirements for the state of Florida, but you will have you know, a similar governing body in your state. So just find out who that is. If, you know, if you're in Minnesota, it's probably the Minnesota Society of CPAs. Or we all have similar names, not exact, but pretty similar. So if you just Google it, you should be able to find your state society, and they all have student outreach that can help you with these things. So to talk about the Florida requirements, um, Florida is a 150-hour rule state, and um, but they, they do it a little different. In order to be, uh, to be eligible to sit for the exam, you only have to have actually 120 hours. And at that point, you can apply to sit for the exam. So that would be at least a bachelor's degree or its equivalent. Um, you need to have completed 24 semester hours of upper division business courses, 24 semester hours of upper division accounting courses, and six semester hours in business law courses. Um, we also require that additional 30 hours that I mentioned, a total of 150, that you need at the time that you apply for licensure. We have a one-year work experience rule as well where you have to work under the supervision of a CPA in order to become licensed. So the first step, once you're ready to take you know, to apply to take the exam, you submit your application. I get from students very consistently is they send me their transcripts and they say, Angie, will you please look at this? I don't know if this counts or that counts or whatever. Unfortunately, in the state of Florida, no one besides the Florida Board of Accountancy has the authority to, take, to say yes, that counts or no, it doesn't. Now, on the other side of that, most accounting department chairs have the information and they are active with the Florida Board of Accountancy in most case faculty who sit on the board. Um, so they know what their requirements are. So your first line should be to your university. If you email me, I'm not going to be able to tell you whether that would work or not. And the Florida Board of Accountancy, unfortunately, will not tell you either until you actually apply. So when you submit your application, even if you don't have all of the upper division level or whatnot that you still need, they will. if you include those course descriptions in your application, they will tell you whether they will meet the requirement or not so that you're not taking classes blindly. And I, I've been talking with them for a while about, you know, I, I feel that it's kind of a challenge for, for you guys out there to try to select your courses when you're not even sure if they're going to count or not. And, and I'm sure that creates a lot of stress for you all, and so that's why I call them and I. I actually finally talked to someone the other day that said, you know, tell them to apply, include the course descriptions for any future classes, and even though they may not get approved to sit right now, that application is still good for three years. So that's the best advice I can give you on that. Once they review your application and they determine your eligibility and you're ready to go, um, they will send you a notification and you'll get a jurisdiction ID number. And from there, you can apply online with NASBA to take the examination. There's a couple of um, different places that you can take them through. Uh, NASBA will send you a notice to schedule. And then at that point, you can begin your examination with ProMetric. Like I said, they have different testing centers. Uh, the one thing you, that is uh, something to consider 
is when you take the first part of the CPA exam, whether you take audit and attestation first or whatever you decide to take first, once you've taken that and passed it, you start an 18 month rolling window, meaning that you only have 18 months to complete the next three parts of the exam. So make sure when you decide you want to apply and schedule to sit, that you're scheduling it where you can get all four parts done within 18 months of passing the first part. Okay, so once you take all four parts of the exam, now you can apply for licensure. This is where that additional 30 hours comes into play. In order to obtain licensure in the state of Florida, you have to have the 150 hours and you have to have the one-year work requirement. Um, if you have all of those, you can go ahead and you can apply for licensure. There's a fee for that. Of course, you know, unfortunately, there's fees for all these little steps I'm mentioning. But um, once you apply for that uh, original licensure application, it's a $50 non-refundable fee. You should be able to get licensure. Um, you have, from the time of passing all four parts of the exam, you have three years that that is good before your time runs out to submit for licensure. So um, that's pretty much how it works in the state of Florida. I do get a lot of international students that email me. I get a lot of students that email me that live in other states who want to come to the state of Florida and you know want to have a CPA license here. So if, if you're considering doing that, Jeff can provide you my email address and I can kind of talk to you specifically about how it works of getting licensure in the state of Florida for being that you tested in another state. So if anyone is in that scenario, I just talked to a student last week who's in Illinois who wants to move to Florida. So it's not an uncommon thing. We do have really great weather here for the most part. So a lot of students want to come here. So that's pretty much the gamut of it. And I, I know it's very overwhelming um, in a lot of ways, but you have your, your state society there to help you along the way. And again, for my Florida folks who are out there, I, I will do my best to help you down that path. Angie, thank you. We really appreciate it and, and I'll be happy to um, send out your contact information. Uh, anybody that wants to message me through the question panel, I, I, can, I can send that to you. Um, and, and like Angie said, if, if you're not in Florida, um, there are resources to support you through this process and, and extremely helpful resources. So Angie, thank you. And if I could just mention quickly, if you go on the AICPA's website, AICPA.org, they have a couple different places on there that you can look at um, CPA exam information on This Way to CPA um, is one of those. Uh, and that, that is a, you know, a nationally based uh, website. So that would be a good resource for you all. And anyone that's in the state of Florida, if you want to go to FICPA.org, that um, we have a section called Future CPAs under Students, and we have exam and licensure information there. And I have it all spelled out much longer than what I just said to you all with all the fees and all the different testing types. So you can use that as a resource. Awesome. And I actually listed out all those sites that you just mentioned to the audience as well. So uh, anyone on the call can, can click and view those, view those sites. So, got, so they've got them. Um, well, I want to turn it over to Mike, and and uh, and but first tell you a little bit about uh, Mike Duffy. Uh, Mike's a CPA. Mike, uh, as you can tell, is is director of business development for Wiley CPA Excel. So Mike is responsible for the product and also the business development for the CPA review products. Mike started out in PwC and on the audit side after graduating from Western Illinois. So Mike, I'm sorry that I confused that with Southern Illinois earlier. Um, where so Western Illinois, he got his BBA in accounting, and and uh, obviously um, became a CPA after that. Um, Mike has an incredible career and is an innovator in CPA test products, and uh, and beyond that is a lot of fun, a great guy, and and uh, and we always have a good time when we get together. And um, and Mike, thank you for taking the time to be here. I, I I'm excited to hear you and. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to you, okay? And, and I'll, I'll talk to you uh, for some Q&A at the end, all right? Mike, you may be on mute. Are you there? 
Mike, if you're talking, I can't hear you, so you may be on mute. <laughs> All right, hang on, everybody. I'm going to get Mike. Angie, while I'm waiting on Mike, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can okay. hear you fine. All right, so hang tight, everybody. Let's get Mike, Mike back up on audio, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get going. Hmm. Oh, I got you. Hang, okay, Mike, so hang tight. I think I, can, I think I might know how to fix this. Hold on, everybody. This is one of the, the joys of live webinars is we have a little technical difficulties, but I bet we can figure this out. Okay, Mike, it says that you are self-muted. So maybe your telephone, you pressed mute on your phone, or maybe you pressed uh, star six to mute yourself. That is what, that's what the system's telling me. Hmm. Let's see. So Mike, I can I can read your text. So Mike, can, are you saying that um, you've tried unmuting your phone or muting it and unmuting it, and it's not, um, it, you're still not, because I'm not hearing you at all. Jeff, can you hear me now? I got you. What was it, Mike? What happened? I don't know. I'm not sure what happened. Can the rest of the crew hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody should be able to hear you if I hear you, and um, and you sound great. So. You know, that, you know, that, that that's that's no nothing near the time we were about to present to I think we had six hundred students across the country <laughs> and your computer literally died twenty seconds before you're supposed to go on. Exactly. <laughs> it's even funnier when I'm getting on going, Hey everybody, it's great to talk to you and then yeah. Jeff's like, uh, Mike, are you there? I'm like, All righty. It takes a little wind out of your sails. All right, so Mike, that's I it. hear you, you sound great. Uh take it away, man. Okay. Well, well, I was thanking Angie for clarification and, and really pointing out to students that, you know, that difference between passing the CPA exam and licensure. You know, in other words, do what you need to do to pass the exam, and then you can always get the license part next. And if, if by the way, your education and process works where you can get it all done in one uh, swoop, so to speak, where you get your 150 and you're all done and you sit for the exam, that's great as well. But I know over time, and you know, I've always seen students get confused on that, saying, well, I don't really plan on being a licensed CPA. And I tell them, I don't care if you're going into public accounting, if you're going into industry, it's more important to have a CPA there. It's mandatory in public accounting to have it. But trust me, as a former controller, um, I would only hire people who were uh, CPAs, who at least passed the CPA exam. Not necessarily licensed to sign audit opinions, but had passed the CPA exam. So encourage you all to um, move quickly and pursue that first and foremost. Now, <clears throat> when I speak to groups like this, one of my first thoughts is, uh, you, you're right, I talk about technology. I developed first software for the CPA exam in 1989. And if I'm not mistaken, most of you perhaps weren't even born. <laughs> and <laughs> you may not even realize, I described to people my first software product, and it was on you know, five and a half inch floppy disks, and so I, and it took 24 of those, and I asked a student uh, recently, I said, guess how much data was on a, one of those big floppies, and they said something like, I don't know, 50 megabytes, and I said 286K, that was it, so uh, uh, over time, I've seen, you know, quite an evolution in technology and, and the uh, continued use of, you know, the internet, so it's really kind of exciting to uh, continue to bring innovation and, and technology into the world of exam prep to basically make your lives a whole lot easier and, and make sure you get through these tests, you know, first time out. So with that, uh, uh, oh, there we go. This is working. So what I'd like to talk about, and uh, I'll move through some of these quickly and others will take a little more time, but obviously should you take the exam, I, I think I'm done with that one. Yes, you should. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a plan. Uh, exam sequence, you know, there are certain opinions I have on 
what part of the exam you should take first. Talk a little bit about test taking strategies, some uh, suggested study approaches. Your exam site strategies, that's a, a whole other element that's been added in over time. Uh, where once upon a time we used to take the test twice a year and we'd walk into major centers and sit down with you know, a thousand or, or more other candidates with a handwritten uh, paper and proctors making circles around you. And so the Prometric testing environment has changed that game quite dramatically. Um, and so we'll discuss that as well. And when I talk about should I take the CPA exam, you know, when I passed the exam, and I received a call from my brother, and he said, hey, Mike, you passed the exam. Congratulations. And he hadn't even opened the envelope. And he just said, well, it was a real small envelope, so I thought you passed. And he opened it up, and I passed. And it was the greatest feeling in the world. And I got home, and he had a giant garbage can in the living room called CPA exam garbage can. All my books, everything was dumped in there. And I tell you what, it was the day that you felt brighter, you were worth more money, and you were done with this thing once and for all. So when you sit and pass this thing, number one, the, the financial rewards throughout your life are there for you. It is instant credibility from someone like myself as I was a corporate controller as well. You know, I looked at any person applying to work within my department, and I wanted to know they were a CPA because it told me something about them. It said they're willing to put in effort, work hard and they have a minimal competency level. So that's a key, uh, key thing as well. And I just described your job requirements. Public, you know, you have to have it uh, versus corporate. But in corporate, if you don't have it, you're just not going to go anywhere. So it's a real important thing to get under your belt. So we'll talk a little bit about um, your plan. And when I talk about a plan, I make a very simple statement. And this applies to everything in your, in your world, you know, personal, professional, financial, you know, if you don't have a plan, you're going to fail. It's really kind of that simple. And uh, when I look at planning, this is something I found some 30 years ago, and it was a the, from Harvard. And they studied all the students that were graduating uh, from that class, and 3% had written goals. And 20 years down the road, that 3% of the graduating class at Harvard was worth more in financial terms the remaining 97% of the graduating class. And it really is something simple. If you just simply write down your goal and follow that goal, the odds are you're going to get close to the goal or get the goal or even achieve beyond the goal. So first and foremost, you need to have a plan. Now, I, I'm going to dovetail this just briefly into my world, I started implementing exam planner type technology back in the early 90s. And that, that's what you see here on the screen is kind of a shot of the software where I think it's so critically important that I kind of integrated that into the program that um, I developed. And just to give you, the, this isn't really so much to promote how we do things, but just to show you the conceptual part of it. I really sat and said, you know, a lot of students haven't had time management. Um, you know, we go from grammar school to high school and ultimately into college. And how do we study for tests? You know, it's usually the night before or whatever where we're all cramming. It's because we really haven't been given a, uh, a true time management approach to our lives, let alone our studies. And so this isn't necessarily the time to go run out and take a six-week course on time management. But um, I decided to incorporate that into software so that a student literally can walk in and say, hey, I'm going to start studying on this day, and I'm going to sit for the exam on this day. And the software runs out and says, well, based on what you're telling me, it's going to take you, you know, 14 hours a week in this scenario. And that's based on our last 5,000 students who passed. And then it generates a custom schedule so that you know exactly what you should be doing, just like I talked earlier, a plan. And that will track you through the process of getting ready for the exam. And if you follow the plan, you're going to produce a result similar to those before you. Okay? And those 5,000 people that make up this 14 hours a week, they all passed. So there's like no excuse. In other words, as you follow that plan, if you're not following the plan, you know you're not moving toward your goal. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, the CPA exam and some of the content. And this is. These are things that I, I throw out, little bits that I think are important for you if you're still in school and you're, and you're looking to get ready for the test. You know, generally speaking, these are the four major sections of the exam. 
and I have some content distributed here to say you know, X percent of SPE financial accounting and reporting in this lower left uh, quadrant. You know, 17 to 23 percent are conceptual framework. But the red arrow, I want to point that out to your attention that literally 16 to 24 percent, if you combine government, governmental and not-for-profit, comprise your far section of the CPA exam. And a lot of degrees do not require a governmental class to be taken. So if you are still in school and you have an option for an elective, say, a bowling class or a governmental class, you know, I, I personally would like the bowling class, but if you have the opportunity, you might take this class because it's 20, up to 20% of the financial accounting and reporting section of the CPA exam. So when I look up at auditing in the upper left, well, auditing's auditing. So if you go through an auditing class, you, you've got pretty good coverage. Over in BEC, um, in our law classes, uh, we have corporate governance, you have an econ class, uh, information systems most of us take. Uh, so, so these are pretty clear and you've covered many of these in your regular core classes. And if you haven't, we teach you those topics like strategic planning or operations management. But when you get down to governmental, a little more tricky. So I strongly encourage you to take a class at your university if you have that opportunity uh, before sitting for the exam. Now, over in regulation, I like to point out something there as well. And as you see here, we have uh, you know roughly up to 20% can be ethics and legal responsibility and another 17 to 20 business law. But then the remaining 60% of regulation is tax driven. And you can see the first category says, you know, federal tax process up to 15%. And what I want to get down to is the bottom. Some of us will take individual taxation classes but aren't required to take any additional tax classes. And once again, I point out to you down below here, the very last one being federal taxation, 18 to 24%. So if I can encourage you to once again look at your curriculum, I would say make sure you take both individual and uh, entities, as they may call it, or, or you know, corporate uh, taxation, 20, up to 24% of your regulation score. So those are two things from a standpoint of curriculum that I kind of want to quickly point out to you. Um, the other thing I'm going to uh, talk about, some of these things Angie addressed. So 75 is a pass, uh, 74 is a fail. Unfortunately, in the old days, they never showed you a score between 69 and 74. They do now. So literally a student can pass or fail with a 74, one question. So it's quite devastating, but in the event you ever experience that, realize that if you immediately go back within six months and take that, uh, that section, you have a good chance of increasing your score by 15% minimally anyhow. So you'll, you will knock it off the next time. Uh, I'm, I'm quite confident in that, but uh, hopefully you don't get that, but if you do, don't let it knock you down. Just get up and go back right after the exam ASAP. Um, yeah, you can pass one section at a time. Uh, Angie discussed the 18-month clock begins to roll after you passed one section. So we need to make sure that we wrap that thing up in uh, 18 months. Now, suggested study times. Um, I, I don't know if, uh, Jeff, if this is going to be posted. You can post this to a site if you want uh, where students can go back and look at this. But these are the suggested study hours that I provide to the students, and it's based on, uh, like I said, the last 5,000 students that have passed each of these sections. This is roughly the amount of hours they have spent in preparation for each one of these sections. So it gives you a really good idea um, as to what you need to be spending uh, to get ready for the test. Um, I think we already talked about registration, uh, and I'm not sure, Angie, if you mentioned that, but. As you know, there are some dark months, and you see in the red here, those are dark months that you can't sit. So when you are planning your examination preparation process, you, you need to take into consideration which month or window you're going to be attempting to uh, sit for the exam in. So just a quick screenshot on that. This is what I'd like to talk about next, is the actual um, exam format and structure. So if you take a look across the four sections, you'll see three of those sections are comprised of 60% multiple choice. Okay, that's pretty straight. BEC, Business Environment Concepts, is a little different. 85% of that is multiple choice. And as you look, you're, you're talking about a three-hour exam. And then I want you to go down to the uh, next category. It says task-based simulations. Those are what we kind of call long problems. I'll show you a screenshot as to what those look like. 
but task-based simulations make up 40% of audit, FAR, and regulation. Okay, great. Written communications makes up the balance of the second course or section BEC, right? So we're going to have to write three essays. Now, I'm going to show you some uh, tips a little later on as to why this is important and how you're going to go about um, taking advantage of how they structure the exam. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So one of the keys to passing this exam is always make sure you're practicing the questions in the AICPA exam format. So what you're looking at here is like this is our software, but we actually were given this detail by the examination group itself from the AICPA, and then we create our software to look just like it. So when you go into the Prometric Testing Center, you look at it and go, oh, yeah, okay, I've been, I've been working in this environment, uh, you know, preparing for this exam for, for three weeks, for five weeks, for whatever time frame it is. And the key is that when you go into the exam, you know, you're not getting familiar with the exam structure. You're literally just going in and taking the questions. So this is one of the key parts of uh, preparation as well. This I talked about when I talked about task-based simulations that 40% are made up on three sections of the exam with TBSs. So what really are TBSs? They're just kind of a, a way of taking kind of a long problem and putting it into a computer-graded environment. So here we have an auditing task-based simulation. And as you can see here, the, um, the question is being asked. The first thing says the auditor uh, does not identify a material misstatement that exists in an assertion. And then they give you literally a pop-up of the correct answers or and incorrect answers you can, cho you can choose. And you click on those answers, and, uh, and that's how this type of question is done. And they also give you uh, a format with research. And they may also give you a format where you have to enter a numerical value. But this just shows you the alternate structure of what we call task-based simulations. So as you go through your preparation in a professional course, you know, we're sitting here walking you through each one of these types of uh, environments as well to make sure you're very comfortable with that format and structure. Now, one of the other things that I always talk to students about and I've studied students' metrics for years, and a lot of students will work on a topic, and then they'll get proficient at that topic and feel very comfortable that they know the topic. But in, in, as you see here in the software that I use, I still force you to, in your preparation process, I still want you to go through a full-on simulated CPA exam because you have to adapt to switching thought processes between topics where you're answering two questions on this topic, then boom, you're shifted over into another topic area. And for some reason, some students experience difficulty with that. So it's critical that you practice full-on simulated CPA exams um, until you become proficient at that as well. So when a student would click on that, literally the full CPA exam, exactly the format, the instructions you would get a Prometric pop up, and you are now going to sit there and take a four-hour CPA exam that will tell you, Here's where you're strong. Here's where you're weak, just like you would at the real CPA exam. So these are just some um, critical tools that I know some students fail to do. They just say, I'll just keep working questions and then go into the exam. No, practice the exam in exam conditions. Real critical step. Exam sequence. Um, a lot of people will tell you, take, take the part that's the most difficult for you, or, or take theory or financial and accounting and reporting first, or take auditing. That's easier. Well, what I'd like to tell you is that you should attempt to do the big rock theory, which is your most difficult section first, with one exception. You should always take BEC last. Now, why do you take BEC last? BEC is comprised of 85 multiple choice and three essays. Historically, the essays have come from the financial accounting and reporting topics or auditing. So a lot of students will open up the BEC section, they'll start working on the essays, and they'll you know, get into a freeze because it's talking about pension accounting or something of that. And they say, well, wow, I haven't even studied financial yet. And really what they're trying to do is grade your writing and communications, but you literally are frozen because you don't even know the, some of the basics of that topic that, yeah, you're familiar with it, but to, to write it a fluid um, essay, you don't feel comfortable. So I encourage people to put BEC last because it also has the highest pass rate. So that's not something that's going to cause a problem for you at the end of your preparation process. So BEC last. So let's talk a little bit about um, when we look at 
the exam. We're going to look at some pass rates and a real, real important area for everybody to understand um, called pretest questions. Let's take a peek. First, we're going to look at pass rates. Now, here's the good news. If you look at the cumulative there for 2013, you know, we're looking at almost 50% per section. They just released the January or the first quarter of this year's stats as well, and they're commensurate to this type of cumulative pass rate. Okay, so we're sitting and hovering at around 50%. So really good news. So it's, it's something when you looked at the exam 20 years ago, 15 years ago, there were pass rates down in the you know, 20 percentiles um, on a given section. So we're sitting here at relatively strong pass rates. Um, so we should be pretty confident if we prepare properly, we'll do well. Now, here is the next part that makes this process even better. So I'm going to give you a little overview of the actual exam itself. So let's take a look here. What are we looking at? Um, we have multiple choice questions, and we have something called operational. We have pretest and total. So I want to kind of focus your attention um, just for a moment on, uh, let's go over to, well, we can look at auditing and FAR side by side. So we're looking at roughly 15 pretest questions out of 90. So you're going to get three testlets, 30 questions each. You're going to be graded ultimately. It's, it's unbelievable when you really realize your entire college career and going through basic financial and intermediate and advanced accounting and governmental and <laughs> right hedges and consolidations. And ultimately, you're going to be getting judged on roughly 75 multiple choice questions in FAR. 15 of the questions are pre-test. What that means is they're not being scored. So what tends to occur is as you're taking the test and you work on your first 30 question testlet, some students will get through that and they'll do quite well. And then they get their second testlet. And all of a sudden, there's a lot of strange questions in there, things that they just don't feel confident with. They might get a large disproportionate amount of IFRS type questions, right? or they may get some really detailed questions on some you know, current accounting change that really aren't fully implemented in the law. So what's happening here is those pretest questions are really just floated out there because they're trying to get a perception um, as to how people are becoming familiar with certain topics, but it's not affecting your grade. So whenever a student speaks to me or when we talk to them about the preparation, it's you know, get through your first testlet, and, and the reality is, if you're doing really well, you may end up getting a second Tesla that you're literally saying, I have no idea what 10 of these 30 questions are. And then you get into the final Tesla, and you have another five or six out of that 30 that you're like, this is very strange. So if we haven't covered it in class, and you've gone through your college curriculum, and you run into these types of questions, you have to realize there's a strong probability these are pretest, and they're not going to be impacting your grade. Okay? So... Um, and, and likewise, let's go across to Regulation BEC. Once again, 60 multiple choice questions in regulation are going to be, be making a big decision on whether or not you're ready to uh, pass the CPA exam, 12 of those being pre-test. So a significant number of questions. Now let's go down to the task-based simulations. These are a little different. Even within a task-based simulation, there's going to be seven tabs. And each one of these tabs, like I showed you earlier, I gave you an example of a tab in auditing. It's going to have a little block of information and ask you to answer something. But even one of the seven in the tabs is, once again, pretest. So when those questions, when you run into a, a question that you're just not familiar with or you just don't feel comfortable, or say you're in regulation and they're asking you about some type of, of unique inheritance tax in a partnership selling a home, and you're sitting there saying, what? Well, what probably means that it's a pretest question, so don't let it get you. Likewise, in BEC, one of the three essays that you write, um, likewise, is going to be a pretest and is not going to be graded. So these are just really important pieces of information as a candidate sitting for the exam that you know the examiner's throwing this at you, and you can't panic with it. You just have to relax and say, eh, pretest. You know, I'll make a guess, and I'll move on to the next question. So that's a real critical thing I want you to be aware of. Now, the other thing I want you to be aware of is uh, at the exam itself, allocate 
the minimum amount of time to multiple choice questions because what tends to happen is students will sit there and dwell on the multiple choice questions and not give themselves enough time to just work through the task-based simulations. Are the task-based simulations more difficult? Not necessarily, but they're in such a unique, different format that sometimes it just takes you a little more time to kind of push through the question. So when you look at a multiple choice question, you read the call of the question, which is the last sentence, you make your best decision possible at that point in time. Don't overly guess and go back because it's 95% it's probability that you'll switch something from the correct answer to incorrect. So you make your decision and move on. Allocate your time, um, the remaining time, to your task-based simulations. Because the last thing you, you want to do is to be sitting there with two tabs left, because each one of those tabs is the equivalent of six multiple choice questions, and you don't want to lose valuable points because you spent too much time on multiple choice questions. So time management, critical key here. OK, quickly, we're going to go into the ProMetric Center here um, real fast. And why I want to show you a couple of these pictures is it's a whole different world. You know, it's a very secure uh, site. So you walk in, you, you know, meet somebody at a counter, and, and here's what you have to have. You're going to have to have two types of ID. You're going to, and that will be things such as driver's license, credit cards, student IDs, um, passports. So it's important that you have proper identification and that matches up precisely with your registration for the exam. They'll give you a locker assignment. You're going to have a biometric uh, check-in, photo ID, and a fingerprint, and that's going to happen multiple times. You know, don't wear something with 50 pockets because you're going to have to be emptying your pockets out. And then there's a metal detector because there's no guns allowed in the exam center either. Now, this is, I love this picture. This is at Prometric. And you see the guy sitting there at the desk. You know, that's his job. So he's going to make you empty your pockets out and pull them inside out, OK? So they're real dead serious about all these things. So this is what you can plan on experiencing when you go. And every time you walk in and out of that exam room, you'll have to go through finger uh, identification scans again and be checked. So real important that you're aware of. This. So maybe you're wearing sweatpants, something nice and comfortable without lots of pockets. Um, there are no paper or pencils. They have come up with things called note boards. So these are kind of uh, new technology. So once you've written enough on your note board and you need a new one, you can walk out and they can exchange uh, your note board and you can get another one. Um, time allocated to the exam, there's an exam plus 30 minutes, which gives you an instruction and a survey, which has to be completed, but doesn't count toward your a four-hour examination either. So you just have to be aware that uh, your total exam time is four minute allocation for surveys. So whew, I'm a little winded here. And let me kind of do um, a little bit of a wrap up. So when I talk to students about their exam prep, uh, first, it's follow a plan, which we spoke about earlier. It's work all questions in the exam format and work them multiple times. Take full practice exams why that's important is and the product you use. A lot of times uh, a product will just say, hey, you scored a uh, roughly a 75% or a 76%. That's not good enough for me. I want to make sure when you take a simulated exam that you get information fed back to you that tells you, OK, you had a 75, but in this area of consolidations, you had a score of 58. So if that's the case, you need to look at that weak area and work on the weak areas because that's the things that will cause you to fail. Not the things you're doing well at, it's the weak areas. Sounds obvious, but a lot of students will tend to study things they're comfortable with versus working on areas that they're weakest in. So that is one of the other final, uh, final keys that I'd like to mention. So some final thoughts. Pass rates, what do we talk about? They're almost at 50% a section, so you can do really well. The classes you've taken in college, um, once again, this is this is not a whole lot of material that's created out of you know out of the sky. It's classes that you've had. Yes, there is certain material that is new. There's other areas that have been added to the exam that you may not have had extensive classes in. But once again, we are going to provide that type of preparation for you that will guide you through through those types of topics as well. So with that approach, you know I am extremely confident that the students will do well as long as they make sure that they take the professional step to prepare properly and that that material um, is designed to make sure they're helping you identify your, your weak, uh, weak areas that you need to make sure you focus on so you do pass. So 
that I think is a very quick uh, overview into some exam strategies and, and thoughts that I have surrounding the exam. So I think at this point I will stop and take a breath because I think we're moving in <laughs> the end of the time parameters that we're supposed to. <laughs> Mike, uh, you might get, grab a Gatorade, okay? <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> awesome. This is great, Mike. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And, and, and we, ha we have a couple questions. Um, Almost all are focused on the exam, but the first one was um, for Angie. Uh, and, and Angie, I know you answered this question um, directly for the student that asked it, but um, let's let Mike catch your breath. I'm going to ask you this question, and Angie, um, take your phone off mute. I'm going to read you this question. Uh, if a student qualifies to take the exam in one state and takes and passes all four parts in that state, will the exam portion generally transfer to another state? Yes. Easy enough, right? Yeah. But the only they just in order for the licensure part, you'll need the additional hours, the additional thirty hours to apply for licensure and the one-year work requirement. Got it. And I imagine that licensure aspect is is different in every state, or is or not? Uh, probably. Pro I'm guessing so too. You know, yeah. Like I, yeah. There's it, that's a good question. There's a lot of similarities with you know one-year work experience and. What not, and then there's the mobility law, which once you do become a CPA, you know, uh, some states have reciprocal agreements, you know, where you can transfer licenses around. So there, that, that just requires a, a student in particular to just pay attention closely with where they ultimately want to practice in. Beautiful. So just a little guidance there. Well, like you, Mike, I mean, you're, you're a CPA from Illinois, but you've been in California now for a while and not, you know, not necessarily practicing, but it's not like you had to take the CPA exam over again when you relocated to California. Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> no. None of us want to ever take the exam over again. <laughs> I mean, you burned all your books in the, the yeah, trash we'd be can. Yeah, we fail. <laughs> yeah. They're all in I the... The old uh, joke was when I took the exam, there was only one FASB, you know, so it's a... Uh, things have changed a lot. <laughs> So, Mike, a couple questions for you, and, and Angie, stay by the phone, too, um, in case we need to talk about Florida-specific, but um, this goes back to, you were talking earlier about the dates and the exam windows. Uh, are the exam windows uh, the same in all states? In other words, are these dates the same, um, you know, example, from January to February 2015th, exam uh the exam window is the same in I Florida. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? There you are. Yes, sorry. Yeah, sorry, you were blacked out for a minute. Thanks. Um, sorry about that. Internet issues. But um, are the exam windows across in the same as all states? For example, like you know, the January to February 2015 exam window is the same in Florida as it is in other states. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, that is correct. All windows are identical. Beautiful. Oh, and one other thing. Um, one other thing. I, I, the question wasn't asked, but I usually like to address it, and that is that um, NASBA does assist students in registering for a number of the states. I'm not sure if um, Angie, if you're familiar with that number, if it's like 30 different states or so, go through um, NASBA, and you you know you register f uh, for the exam through NASBA for a given state, um, but it's also important to note that there's a different time parameter when you register with some states as far as how long it'll take you to get your um, your NTS and be approved, you know, to sit for the exam. But some some states are as quick as you know you 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 do your application, you send everything, and in five days you're approved, and then you you know get your NTS and you get you can schedule the set. But other states it can take, you know, some say it can take four or five weeks, six weeks to do that. And Angie, would you, is Florida, could you tell me a little bit about Florida's process? Is that the length from a step of application to getting approval, or is there a, a rough guideline there? Um, our Board of Accountancy says three to five days. Oh, okay, so that's pretty, that's pretty darn fast. Okay, but just so everybody is aware, they can, they, they can vary from state to state, but you know, just be cognizant of that fact so when you check into it, you're, you're not thinking, oh, I'm going to get approved, I'm going to start this Friday and get approved next Friday, and I'm going to sit in a month. You might, you might want to check uh, with your, your local uh, state if you're in a state other than Florida. 
Well, one other thing to mention since you, you brought that up, and I mean, that's what it says on their website. Of course, there are extenuating circumstances that could drag that along, but there are more and more uh, colleges that are popping up online um, that do not use seat hours. And so that, because I sit on the floor board of accountancy calls, that is something that has created a lot of lag in students getting approved to sit for the exam because when, when they set up the initial the initial parameters it was based on semester hours and uh, not quarter they they have a way to recognize quarter hours but you have that second layer of accreditation and so I have been on a few calls where there's been a student on that's been and their professors are on trying to explain that yes this counts for this many semester hours and it so that is something to consider if you're not at a bricks and mortar school um, you'll, you'll want to make sure that you have faculty there that could help you in the event that you need to go before the board, um, you know, to explain the seat hours that you have in that class, um, what all you covered in that class, so that they can help you get your application pushed through. Okay, that's good advice. Yes. Let me ask you guys a couple other questions. Um, uh, this is uh, actually one that I've, I've seen quite a bit, Mike, and probably you have some pretty significant opinions on, but um, what, how does the study, what, what is your recommendation on the study strategy for full-time, uh, for those with full-time jobs, which a lot of our members, a lot of people on this call are, you know, are, have jobs, have full-time work, and also want to take the CPA exam. So why don't you talk about that for a minute? Well, you know, the, the reality is when you're putting in 40 hours a week and you're adding probably another, uh, you know, 12 to 14 and commuting, you know, you just have to be a little bit more pragmatic about the process. And I would just simply, uh, I know this sounds obvious, but I wouldn't try to overcommit myself to a extremely tight study schedule. And so if I'm looking at, say, auditing, and if I'm a college student, you know, I personally would say, you know, you can get ready for this section in easy three to four weeks. Um, so you can work through the you know thousands of questions a you know, couple of times. You can watch all the multimedia presentations and take simulated exams, etc. Now, if I'm a professional uh, working the schedules that you're working, I would really I would really probably take that exact schedule and I would probably double it, and I would only use my weekends and perhaps one weekday like a, maybe a hump day, a Wednesday, where I'm going to spend three hours doing, you know, two hours doing some work. Because you really want to be, you know, on a Saturday, it's a little easier to get up and say, yes, I'm going to take my, I'm going to get up 9 a.m., and I'm going to just study from 9 to 12, and I'm going to do it on Saturday and Sunday, and I'm going to enjoy the other parts of my day. And then when I get toward the end of my, say, auditing, I'm going to get to, to the end of my six, seven-week process. Oh, great. Well, I put in, you know, six or eight hours a weekend. And if all of a sudden you realize and start doing the numbers in your head, that's four weekends for the first month. That's 30, you know, for 32 hours. Then you remember I said another three weeks or so into the next thing, all of a sudden you got 24. If you remember, I showed you that you need 70 hours in auditing to be properly prepared. So I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is make sure you don't overcommit yourself during the week. Remember, a plan is all about making sure you can follow it. And if you make a plan that's unrealistic, it's going to be demotivating. You're not going to be on task. Your life's going to be miserable. And as a result, you're not going to perform well. So, so I guess that would be my recommendation is to spread it out over a longer period of time. Take it on weekends, but don't sit there and work 10 hours on a weekend day. It is not a productive way to study. Keep, keep your study modules. You know, obviously it can't be 20 minutes. It, it certainly can be an allocation of three to four hours on a Saturday and Sunday and allow yourself the rest of the day to enjoy life. Yeah, Mike, that's my sister-in-law is a, she's, I've been out of college six years and is a, work, you know, works in New York City, has a small child, and she, she's doing that very thing. She's actually taken CPA Excel um, because she loves it for the flexibility that, that, that it offers. And her, her focus was to spread it out and, uh, and, and really use her weekends. Um, yep. And and lock herself out. Uh, <laughs> of, of yeah, you just have to. Yeah. You just have to because I mean you know let's be honest you work during the day and you get home say six thirty seven you're done. and you eat at eight o'clock you're going to start studying 
I don't think so. You're better off watching The Voice and laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when Saturday morning comes, yeah, you just get up, you go for a quick run or a walk, and then you can sit down and say, okay, lock myself to my desk for three hours. I'm going to watch some videos. And the technology that we have, even like for our course, is kind of fun because students can work everything on a phone or an iPad or a, you know everything syncs up. So literally, if you find yourself and you're sitting there and it's a, I know this sounds really stupid, but it's a Saturday afternoon, you're at some type of uh, event, or you're at home and you're really not doing anything, you can literally hop on your iPhone, sit there and play with questions, and you don't keep getting things done. So you got to make it as fun and stimulating and in a controlled setting. Don't, don't let it take over your life because it, it, it never works. I've seen so many people that get obsessed and they get into these massive hours on weekends. I, I'm doing 18 hours a day and I'm like, great, you're not remembering anything. <laughs> right? So, so, so that any memory retention that you study continues to explain at a point in time the, the, you'll, you'll be forgetting 80% of what you just did within six hours. So do it pragmatically <laughs> and not excessively. It, it, thanks, Mike. And Angie, you may have an opinion on this. I've, I've certainly got one, but um, Catherine wants to know what can students call themselves like on their resumes after they have been approved to take the exam um, and after they have passed the exam but aren't licensed. I, 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 my take on that is, is say I'm um, CPA eligible and then give the date. She wondering, is there, you know, what's the phrase like CPA candidate? I'm just curious if either one of you know of a, of a good term that you would use on a resume you know, to describe that. Oh, I tell you what I, what I look for, and this is, this is a really good question by her, just from my perspective. And that is that literally it said, you know, here's where I went to school. Here I passed the CBA exam in May 2014. That's what, that's what I want to see. You know, so that's just coming from me as a person who was once upon a time, you know, I worked Price Waterhouse and then I was a controller. And that's what I'd like to see is I want to see that you pass the exam. So if you have passed that exam, make sure that's Literally, right, either education, I went to Western Illinois University, and a continued line right there says, pass the CPA exam May 2014. I'm like, great, everything I need to know is right there about your education. That's just my comment. As far as eligibility, I, that I ask Angie if she has any thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, we've, uh, we've heard of various listings for that. We've had um, exam qualified or um, approved to sit. We, I actually have students that come up to me at networking events, and they already have little cards made and everything, and um, that they'll have various things. But I know some of the beta alpha size, you know, around the state of Florida, they denote on the name tags of certain students whether they're exam qualified or not. Um, for us as, a, as an organization, um, we list our students under exam qualified so that that way we know kind of where they are in the process. And I, I believe, you know, most firms will, will be able to understand exactly what that means. I mean, it's pretty cut and dry. And it would help, it would probably help them because they know that they don't have to, you know, some firms will support you to, to get your CPA all the way, um, and other ones they want you like what Mike said, they want to know you've already passed. So it does kind of help them delineate. And if you tell them exam qualified, then they, they know everything they need to know. Or there you candidate. go. And, and they know, by the way, if you're at a social networking and someone has that, I, I guess my reaction would be, okay, clearly they have the hours. This is somebody that is coming out, you know, that, that could be somebody that we'd really like to interview. And I guess I'd like that. What would you say, exam qualified? Uh, what was the? Exam qualified. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or approved to sit. We, I've, I've seen various things. Um, we call them exam qualified. At the yeah, I like exam qualified. I mean, That's to me, if I looked down and said exam qualified, I'd be like, oh, okay, so this person is it could be coming out soon. Wow, I really like this person. Yeah, I'm going to put a notation here. We'll follow up. Maybe uh, this is someone we want to have get in for another interview or something. <coughs> so. Yeah, I've also seen approved to sit for the CPA exam. So I like that. I've got, I've got two more questions I really wanted to ask, and, um, and I'll give you guys uh, – you know, just answer them relatively quickly, and, and th because we're up against the hour, and uh, and then I want to close up uh, with with a couple of, of next steps. But um, Tabitha wants to know if I wanted to sit for the CPA exam, 
to check my progress, but, but wanted to wait to take the exam until I reached my 150 hours, which may be at some date distant in the future. Will I have to reapply to take the exam? Hopefully that makes sense to you, Mike. Well, in the state of Florida, your application is good for three years. I there you can't go. speak to other states. Well, I, I bet that I bet that most states, you know, have a reasonably similar rule. So hopefully that answers the question in a general, general sense. Um, yeah. All right. The other one is, uh, Mike, I'll give to you is is um, is uh, how often are the sections of the CPA exam updated? Do we run the risk of information, you know, being outdated? quickly after we graduate? Right. Good question. So um, the exams are, are you know, updated from time to time. Like last July, we had the Auditing Clarity Project. So that was a big release that came out and that updated the whole you know, auditing uh, content area. Uh, things like you know, audit opinions, emphasis on matter paragraphs, all that stuff came out. New terminology, unmodified versus you know, unqualified opinions and all that. So from time to time, they come out, and we're aware of that. Uh, we are, as you know, preparation companies, we we jump all over that. So that really is one of our key things: is that all content is continually up to date in the software product. So as the students say, is in our program. Um, and, and unfortunately, I, I you know some students I know may want to just run out and grab a set of books or do something like that, but. The reality is, you know, you re really need to be up to date on this. You really can't afford not to be aware of, of certain technical changes. It, it can be literally every six months. There can be, there's new releases and new content that's being pulled into the exam. Uh, if there's new tax law changes, say this December, that will be effective uh, starting next July 1st. And but in our software, it's all electronic, so all that content continues to get updated. And even if you're studying for the exam, say for November for the, the regulation, the tax section, and you don't get it done, and then you're going into the next year but new law is going to be covered, the software automatically updates that and removes anything that's obsolete or outdated and kind of says, hey, here's where you're at and here's the new stuff you need to cover. So you know, that's part of our job to make sure you're studying the most up-to-date content for your particular exam. I hope that helps. No, that helps. That's perfect. Um, and and Angie, any any other thoughts on that, or or are you good? No. No. Okay. Yep. Um, let's see. So, I, uh, I Angie, I've got one question, but I'm gonna assign it to you um, over the uh, just to answer um, written, if you can, since we need to wrap up. But okay. Let's do this. Um, Angie, FICPA is awesome. Uh, thank you for putting together uh, two great, great webinars this week. For everybody who's on the call, um, we'll, we'll definitely be sending out a recording to this. Uh, I usually get asked if we could send the slides out. Mike presented a lot of excellent information, really a tutorial of how to, how to think about this exam. Um, and, and so be looking for that. Also, and I think this is a really, really interesting offer, and C CPA Excel, Mike was was generous to, to offer this, but but uh, you, you, I'll, I'll send out a, an email. Look for an email from us tomorrow morning that I would give you a two-week free trial uh, on CPA Excel. You can kind of check out some of the tools that that um, Mike has shown today. And, uh, there's no uh, commitments to that. It's just something you can you can play around with it, and I'll, I'll give you the, some contact information with them if you have any other follow-up questions. Um, that being said, Mike. Um, yeah, thanks so much for being here, for walking our audience through this. Uh, I always learn something out of each one of these webinars. And before I sign off, just wanted to say thanks, sir. I really appreciate you being here. Oh, hey, it's great. Always, always great to kind of join in and talk to talk to students, and that's the fun part. You got it. Well, um, thanks, Angie. Thanks, Mike, and thank all of you for being here. We're going to sign off for now. I'll send out the recording, a link to the trial some contacts over at CPA Excel. That being said, I hope everybody has an awesome, phenomenal rest of your week, and we'll talk soon. Bye now. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Okay, bye now.